Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. of today's tape is to discuss the location and position of these teeth, to relate to you the occlusion of these teeth, to discuss the morphology of each individual tooth and the terminology, and to give you some identifying characteristics of these teeth. We have three molars in each mandibular quadrant, the most posterior teeth in the mouth. We have approximately the same ages in which they're present in the mouth. About six years, our first mandibular molar comes in. Twelve years, approximately, our mandibular second will come in. And our thirds are very irregular, sometimes not present, sometimes uh, 17, 20, 25, 30. Sometimes they're there and they won't come in. So we get a lot of variation on that. This mandibular first premolar oftentimes becomes the statistically the first carious permanent tooth in the mouth. It comes in very early. It's uh, most posterior in the mouth in children. becomes difficult in the hygiene. And it's also probably one of the most used teeth in the mouth. I call it the most important single chewer in the mouth is the mandibular six-year molar. It's the hardest to replace. It's probably one of the most important teeth we have as far as chewing. It's basically a grinder and does a very heavy bulk of our chewing in this particular area, located and centered around this tooth. We'll spend quite a lot of time talking about this tooth. You'll spend an exceptional amount of time uh, replacing, and removing, and working on this tooth in uh, clinical dentistry. Our teeth, generally speaking, here, have a tendency in the mandible to angle in a bit towards the center of the mouth, and they have a tendency many times to angle forward, particularly as we go posterior. Actually, our entire arch is somewhat on a curve, particularly the posterior teeth. It's sometimes referred to as a curve of speed, where our maxillary molars seem to be getting shorter and our mandibular molars a little longer. We get a little bit of a curve in here, and this is characteristic by the teeth being at an angle. They seem to blend into that curve. We get a rather significant size difference on these teeth. Maybe we can take a look at the root structure over here on this side before we get into the size. These are basically two rooted teeth, one on the mesial side and one on the distal side. And they haven't got the buccal lingual type roots that we have in the maxillary, just two rooted. We have the same type of overjet that we're referring to in the anterior teeth. Our mandibular teeth are to the lingual, and our buccal cusps, the cusps on the buccal surface here, are frequently the main chewing cusps as they occlude into the central sulcus area of our maxillary teeth. And they will occlude into the fossas and into the embrasures in the marginal ridge areas in a normal type of occlusion. The areas in which they do occur, occlude, become rather significantly important. The position of these cusps help identify orthodontic classifications. Probably the most important single one, which many of the orthodontic classifications are based on, is this maxillary mesial buccal cusp. It is said to occlude in the mesial buccal groove, or sometimes it is just called the buccal groove, of our first mandibular molar. We'll discuss these grooves and their names here in a bit. This particular relationship is felt to be the usual relationship that is found in uh, most of our normal growth. If we're forward or posterior to that, then we start picking up different terms and classifications, but they seem to key on this relationship right here, which is normal in this instance. Let's go to our individual tooth and start to pick up a little bit of the new terminology. I say new terminology on this. Actually, again, our terminology is basically surface-oriented here. 
and it's not entirely new. If we look at the mandibular first, we'll find that it is a five-cusp tooth. And again, basically with just two roots. So it should be very easy to identify in that category as being a mandibular molar. We have to determine, you know, right from left, first from second, and things of this nature. And in the mouth sometimes when uh, one or more of these are missing, you have to determine them in the mouth just from the occlusal anatomy, from what is left of the uh, crown showing in the mouth. And many times it's uh, filled or um, destroyed by decay, we can get into further problems in identifying which one is which. And this becomes important in the type of treatment we're involved in. We got five cusps, three on the buckle and two on the lingual. Let's look at the buckle lingual, see if we can get that identified here first off. Again, if you remember, these are pulling to the lingual and our buckle cusps are doing most of our occluding. So our buckle cusps are pulled in closer to the center of the tooth. It doesn't come quite as far into the center of our tooth as our premolars do but certainly comes in much further than what our maxillary cusp do. Our height of contour is a little bit higher than our maxillary cusps, and we don't develop this flattened surface, real flat up in through here. We've got more of a uh, convexity to our entire buccal surface as it pulls further onto the occlusal. Our height of contour on the lingual, very definitely higher in the mid to occlusal third of the tooth. Actually, about the middle third is where it's, it's felt to generally lie. So that'll give us our buccal and lingual orientation. As far as our mesial and distal orientation, our tooth is usually a little bit broader to the mesial. We have the largest cusps to the ridge is further cervical mesial numerous characteristics that will help us to identify this tooth. Overall outline form on this tooth is said to be pentagontal, having five surfaces. One surface across the mesial, one down the buccal, one down the lingual, and it's felt to have two surfaces somewhat towards the distal here. One in kind of a distal buccal direction, and one in more of a distal lingual direction out here. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as a pentagonal type shaped tooth. Let's get back to these cusps now. On the buckle we have three, and they are termed the mesial buckle cusp, and then we have a distal buckle cusp, and the third cusp is the distal. And oftentimes it'll be located almost around on the distal marginal ridge area of the tooth. On the lingual, simply mesial lingual and distal lingual. So we pick up one additional term here, that's a distal cusp, which is on the buccal surface, or more towards the buccal surface. We have no strong ridges that cross this tooth occlusally. We haven't got any transverse or oblique ridges. We have a very strong, characteristic, prominent central fossa, and then our central groove both ways to the mesial fossa, mesial pit area, and also to the distal fossa and distal pit area of the tooth. So this actually runs in both directions here. And then the uh, grooves that would run out of this, and you can term them in whichever direction they're going. If we had one up here, we could you know, call it the mesial buccal clusal groove. Actually, the strongest grooves and most prominent ones are the ones that divide the cusps. And the one to the lingual, of course, is very simply a lingual groove. It divides the cusps rather sharply. And actually our cusps on the lingual are sharper than our buccal cusp. They're more conical, come to a stronger point, and they're actually higher, uh, or I should say further from the cervical than what our buccal cusps are. So they're more sharply pointed or conical, and they're actually further from the cervical uh, than what our buccal cusps are. But this lingual groove divides our two rather sharp lingual cusps. But it doesn't come down onto the lingual surface very much. It certainly doesn't cross the height of contour at all on the lingual surface. Our buccal cusps are said to be rather blunt, short and blunt type of uh, 
cusps, particularly in relation to the maxillary cusp, which are much more sharper in their apex of their cusp tips. Our largest one is to the mesial, mesial buccal cusp, and then we have a mesial buccal groove coming out. And this does extend down onto the tooth surface rather a significant degree, and sometimes will cross the height of contour. Not frequently, but sometimes it actually will. Then we have our groove coming out, separating our distal buccal, distal lingual, or our distal buccal cusp and our distal cusp. Let me get them right. This is the distal buccal groove. And this extends rather prominently down onto the buccal surface. It oftentimes will cross the height of contour and actually groove the height of contour of the tooth. Same basic terms as far as our marginal ridges. Same basic terms as far as our line angles, point angles. Uh, we have important triangular ridges on these, which are all fairly prominent. And uh, these are simply termed by the cusp they're coming from. Mesial buccal triangular ridge. So we haven't picked up a lot of new terminology. We've got our distal cusps and our two different uh, names on our uh, buccal grooves, mesial buccal and distal buccal. So basically three new terms occlusally here. We go to our roots on this tooth. As I said, we have two. And we've got a mesial root and a distal root, simply by the area in which they're located. Now, remember in the maxillary, we had one root that was broad and flat, and our mesial buccal was the broad, flat root. On our mandibulars, the mesial root here is also uh, broad and flat, and broader and flatter than our distal root. And oftentimes, we'll have a concavity uh, down the root surface, proximal root concavity. Uh, this really makes this tooth strongly locked into the bone. These roots are frequently fairly blunt, but again, like our maxillary, they're tri bifurcated. Here we have a bi, two roots, bifurcated, fairly close to the cervical line, fairly close to the crown. This gives us a fairly short root trunk. Our distal root is generally starting to round a little bit more. We don't have the concavities in it that we would in the mesial, and it's sometimes a shorter root. It has a tendency to be a little straighter and angle towards the distal more. The mesial root is frequently coming down a little straight, or it will have a little hook to it, a distal hook as it gets towards the apex but our distal root is frequently straighter and just plain directed or oriented towards the distal here. Let's look at uh, some seconds here, and we'll start to get a comparison between the teeth. Let me turn it around this way for you. Again, if we looked at our first, we find three buckle cusps. Our seconds generally will have two buccal cusps. Our seconds are more frequently referred to as rectangular. They really haven't got this uh, double surface on the distal that uh, our first have because of that distal cusp. We're talking about a four cusp tooth with two roots. And uh, this makes it, again, fairly characteristic tooth to identify. Oftentimes, our central pit is the strongest on this. And let me slide in another one here that has got some stained grooves on it that might show it a little bit better. We have a very strong central fossa, central pit. And our mesial and distal pits are not nearly as prominent, but are connected with a long groove, our central groove, that traverses all the way from the mesial pit to the distal pit. And because of our four cusps, somewhat equal in size, although the mesials are a little bit larger and a little bit broader, we get a 
cross shaped in our center of our tooth because we've got our long central groove and then we've got simply a buccal groove coming out crossing the cusp uh, ridges and down onto the buccal surface. Oh, this comes down onto the buccal surface in the first and the second, so about half, two-thirds of the way. It's a rather strong groove onto the buccal surface. Our lingual groove coming out, crossing the cusp ridges, but not coming onto the lingual surface very much. It doesn't really come down onto it. We've got a higher height of contour here, you remember, and it doesn't cross this height of contour. So we've got a kind of a cross-shaped occlusal with a four type of uh, equal cusp, a little bit more rectangular, although a little bit broader to the mesial than we are to the distal. We're not quite as sharp on our line angles again. Our line angles starting to become more rounded, particularly to the distal. Our distal surface uh, has a tendency to round significantly more than the mesial. And that's basically the same on our uh, first, that our mesial line angles are the sharpest, and the distal is quite a little more rounded. We've got the same basic identification buccally and lingually. We just look to the tooth in, uh, from the mesial surface, and we can get the height of contours on this. Height of contour on the lingual, being in the middle portion of the tooth, having a fairly evenly convex uh, lingual surface. Our lingual cusp on the mesial lingual cusp being a little further from the cervical, a little larger, more prominent, and pulling into the center from the buccal surface, and our, from the lingual surface here, I should say, our buccal height of contour is a little bit higher from the cervical line than in the maxillary, but still basically in the cervical third area. And then we have these buccal cusps pulling quite a ways on into the center of the tooth here. So well, that's same basic identification in that regard. And these heights of contours uh, become very important in uh, all of our restorative and periodontal procedures, and we'll be kind of dwelling and uh, hitting on this rather firmly. Our root structures on this are usually held pretty close to being under the tooth. Uh, in fact, is I've got couple in comparison here that we can show you. We've got two first here, which you can see the tr bifurcation is fairly high and the roots are spread fairly well. And on our seconds, get this over on the buckle surface there, seconds we've got roots that are either fused or directly under the trunk of the, or under the width of the crown. We're not spreading wider than the crown as we do in some of our first. So they're a little straighter, a little closer to being uh, under the crown, not nearly as uh, bifurcated as close to the cervical. We have a much longer root trunk on these teeth. You know, we have the same basic characteristic as we had in the first, the mesial root being the broadest root and the widest, the flattest, the longest, and our distal root having a tendency to be a little smaller, a little more rounded. But again, the roots frequently tapering off towards the distal. They have a tendency to either curve or just taper towards the distal. We don't get as strong a concavity in these roots, either on the uh, mesial surface of the mesial root or on the uh, distal surface of the mesial root there. So they're not quite as firmly locked into the jaw as what our first are, and this makes a big difference on removal and anchoring restorations and what have you. If we look to our thirds, and again we won't spend an awful lot of time on our thirds, we'll note that we have a rather very rounded distal portion, and actually this is probably uh, a little bit large in proportion to our other teeth because the thirds usually become smaller. But this varies tremendously. Sometimes uh, these thirds will be huge, huge teeth. Sometimes they'll have uh, uh, three root, three cusps on the buccal surface. Sometimes they'll have two. Uh, they'll be a, either five or a four cusp tooth. They, they vary tremendously. One of the things that happens though is that our Usually our occlusal table is narrower from the buccal uh, to the lingual. The 
tooth, the cusp seems to both on the buccal and the lingual pull in towards the center considerably more, making this inner cusp di distance narrower here. But again, our anatomy is more indistinct, and we've got a large percentage of uh, irregular uh, grooves, fissures, and pits, and it's pretty hard to uh, come up with specific terminology for some of these grooves because they're just running them all directions. Uh, our roots, again, incline towards the distal rather significantly, but they're also quite significantly uh, uh, fused, oftentimes very sharply curved and pointed, and in all directions here. I have a, a variety of seconds and thirds. Usually the first have got characteristics so sharp that uh, it's not too difficult to uh, mix them up. But our, here's our other one that belongs in here. Our seconds so usually got this cross shape, four cusps, four rectangular, and one thing I should point out on all these teeth, and that is that they are broader from the mesial to the distal by about a millimeter or so than they are from the buccal to the lingual. Remember, our maxillary teeth were just the opposite. They were broader from buccal to lingual. So here now we've switched around. We've got a tooth that's broader from mesial to distal. This is in the first, the second, and the third. They've got their greatest width in the uh, opposite direction here. Our seconds have this sharp cross in them, generally all of them basically, and our four cusps. Our thirds, typically irregular, asymmetric, uh, very round on the distal surface, full of accessory fissures, pits, grooves, and uh, root structure on them, very commonly uh, fused, oftentimes very sharply distally inclined, oftentimes become very pointed at the apex and uh, cause quite a lot of difficulty in uh, removal. See a nice sharp pointed hook on that which could be uh, big problem in removal. If we look to our mandible, we find the approximate dimensions of these teeth here, and we'll find that uh, the differences in sizes are proportional. As I indicated to you, usually they'll come a much larger on our first, smaller, more rounder on our second, our thirds considerably smaller and uh, more rounded yet. In this instance, we had a three cusp uh, on the buckle of our first, but our third only had two. As I said, this third can, third can be anything, really. So we're going to concentrate on identifying first and seconds, and if it's not a first or a second, it uh, necessarily needs to be a third. We look to the other side here, we can see that these buccal cusps are actually worn flat. They're worn right down into the dentin on all of the buccal cusps. Our lingual cusps really haven't worn too much at all. They're fairly sharp, and uh, we haven't worn into the dentin. Again, this is basic occlusion pattern. You can see this throughout. Same exists back in here. You can see the occlusion here, too. We wore onto the mesial marginal ridge of our third molar, but the rest of our third molar didn't contact at all. It just stayed in its virgin, irregular, pitted form and uh, stained up a bit. But uh, see a very heavy uh, occlusion on this mesial marginal ridge area here. Well, this skull didn't have a maxillary third molar, so this just wasn't really in occlusion, except for the mesial portion of this. Remember that this tooth uh, or these mandibular teeth were generally located about a half of a uh, tooth ahead, at least in the bicuspid area, or at least a one half a cusp ahead of the maxillary teeth. And so we do pick up an occlusion here. The only two teeth we have in the entire mouth that occlude with only one tooth in the opposite arch are our mandibular central incisors, which occlude only with the maxillary central incisors, and our maxillary third molars which usually occlude with the distal two-thirds of our mandibular third molar. All the rest of the teeth will occlude with more than one tooth in the opposite arch. This is an important relationship to our basic dental occlusion.
Well, we tried to review basically the anatomy of these teeth, and we don't come up with a lot of new terms, but we come up with uh, a few of them. Basically, our distal cusp, our mesial buccal groove, and distal buccal groove are the only real big terms. Uh, we've got different roots but, uh, and different cusps, uh, but they're basically oriented to the surfaces in which they're located on, and the rest of the terminology is pretty much the same. Important to remember that our buccal cusps are pulling onto the center of our tooth more. We've got a rather distinct differences in the height of contours. We've got uh, a fairly distinct difference in the widths of our tooth, being wider from the mesial to the distal. Let's look at the pulpal morphology of these teeth. Let's review briefly here the external root morphology, because we know that this will very specifically relate to our internal pulpal morphology. On the mesial surface, we're involved with a broad, flat root that frequently has a concavity or groove down the center of it. In fact is, we also have a concavity or a groove frequently down the, the distal aspect of our mesial root. And when we have these strong concavities, frequently this will be a ribbon-shaped canal on the inside, or in this instance, we actually have two canals. This groove is pinched off the internal into two separate canals in this one single mesial root. On the distal, we're generally involved with a little bit more ovoid root, although it still is broad from the buccal to lingual, not nearly as broad as our mesial root, and it's a little more ovoid, and generally we'll have one larger canal in this root. Let's look at the cross-sections of these teeth now. We're looking at a buccal-lingual section here. Our buccal is out at this area because we've got our low height of contour close to the cervical. We've got our mesial buccal pulp horn. This is a section through the mesial root. And we've got our mesial lingual pulp horn. Not and then we've got our pulp chamber, which is rather well defined in these molars. And we'd have a mesial buccal root canal and a mesial lingual root canal here exiting in separate foramen. If we go to our mesial distal section, this is a section through the buccal here. So we've got our mesial buccal pulp horn and also our distal buccal pulp horn. The pulp horn underneath the distal cusp is not showing in this section, but generally speaking, we've got a pulp horn which comes up almost centered under each of the cusps. Well-defined pulp chamber here. And then we've got our mesial buccal root canal, the section through the mesial buccal portion of it here. And then our single canal to the distal, just our distal root canal. Now, occasionally this distal may have two. As I indicated to you, there is some concavities in this broad and flattened root. For our purposes and examination purposes and national boards, we're generally going to consider the distal as having one. Although I warn you ahead of time, when you get into studying the details of these pulpal anatomy for endodontic purposes, when you start treating these teeth, you're going to be told that there are variations. And some of the variations are that this distal canal will have two. And uh, I think without getting into the details of the variations, you should recognize that uh, uh, there can be variations in these canals. But for our purposes, we'll consider the mesial root as having two canals and the distal root as having one canal, which is by far the most common. If we look to a buccal-lingual section of a second molar, again, our buccal surface here, where we've got the height of contour closest to the cervical, find that we have our same two pulp horns. And here we have a mesial buccal and our mesial-lingual pulp horn, well-defined chamber, and our mesial-lingual root canal, and our mesial buccal root canal and our mesial lingual root canal. In this instance, these happen to be joining the two canals before they exit through the apical foramen. This is moderately common. It's still considered as having two canals, which have to be checked and sought and treated accordingly when we're treating the internal aspects of these teeth. 
we look to our mesial distal section of our second molar, we find that the anatomy on these are very similar to the first, as much as we have the same basic pulp horns and pulp chamber, and our same basic root canals. Notice that our root canals here are just a little bit straighter as our roots are a little shorter and straighter under the crown. So they take the form of the external morphology of these teeth. Now when we get to our thirds, again, they vary very widely and are really dependent upon the external morphology of the teeth. We have a chart in the back of our workbook that deals with the measurements of these teeth. Now, we don't expect you to memorize this whole chart, but it might take a couple minutes to go over with you the things that are important in relation to this chart and the purpose that we have it in there. Now, if we look at our chart here to identify our areas, we've got tooth number eight, and then we go down to or posterior to tooth number one, our third molar. So we're going from central to third molar across in this direction. These are our different measurements. Our first one is our incisal cervical, or our occlusal cervical measurement. This is usually referred to as the height of the crown. Important thing to recognize here is that our maxillary central incisor is the, got the longest crown from incisal to cervical. And generally speaking, these become shorter. And we get shorter crowns from incisal or occlusal cervically as we go posterior. Till we get to our third molar, which is actually uh, four millimeters shorter than our central incisor was. So generally this crown length becomes shorter as we go posterior. In the mesial distal width of our maxillary central, this is the widest of our anteriors and we generally get smaller in our mesial distal width until we come to our molars, which of course are rather broad. Our maxillary first being the largest again and then we get smaller as we go to our second and thirds. In our facial lingual width, or this is called labial lingual width in the anterior, or buccal lingual width, if we get to the posterior here, we generally start out small and get continuously larger in our labial lingual width as we go posterior. Uh, I think an important thing to keep in relationship here is the relationship of our labial lingual width with our mesial distal width. To begin with, we're wider mesial distally until we get to the cuspid. And the cuspid changes over and we become wider in the facial lingual dimension. And this continues throughout the rest of our posterior teeth. We're wider in our facial lingual dimension than all the rest of our posterior teeth. Now when we're discussing our root length, our root length is the longest in the cuspid. And these become smaller as we go to the anterior, and they become progressively smaller, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, right down the line as we go to our posterior. It's also, I think, of significance to note that our lingual root is generally about a millimeter longer than our buccal roots on these posterior teeth. The lingual root is definitely the longer root on our maxillary posterior teeth. In our total tooth length, this follows pretty much our root length. Our cuspid is certainly the longest, and we get smaller as we go both anterior and posterior progressively. If we look to the measurements on our mandibular teeth, we'll note that our greatest crown length, or distance from the cervical to the incisal, is in our cuspids. In fact, is our mandibular cuspid, we generally call the uh, long, narrow crown and it has the longest crown from the incisal to the cervical of any permanent tooth in the mouth. And we generally will get shorter as we go both to the anterior and progressively as we go to the posterior. So this is our key tooth in relation to crown height or uh, crown length from the incisal to cervical in our mandibular teeth. As we look to the mesiodistal dimension here, our mandibular teeth are very narrow mesial distally. This is where we pick up our half cusp difference in our occlusion. So we've got a very narrow uh, mesial distal dimension in the anteriors, and this gets progressively larger as we go to the posteriors until we come to our first molar, which is the widest tooth mesial distally, 
in the entire mouth. That's the number one tooth widthwise in the mouth. And then we get progressively smaller as we go to our second and thirds. We go to our facial lingual width. We'll find that we wider from the facial lingual That's the opposite as it was in the maxillary. We stay wider all the way till we get to our molar, our first mandibular molar, which becomes wider in the mesial distal dimension than it is in our buccal lingual dimension. And this stays the same and gets gradually smaller. One of the things we might point out here too that is, I think, of significance, in talking about our mesial distal width, we talked about starting out uh, small in our mesial distal width, which is much smaller than our anteriors in the maxillary. Our bicuspids are exactly the same as they are in the maxillaries. And then our molars in mesial distal width are significantly wider by about four or four and a half millimeters than our maxillary molars. So although we're smaller here in our incisors, we become significantly wider here, and we end up with our total arch length mesially distally being about a millimeter's difference, our mandibular being just about a millimeter shorter totally. If we look at our root lengths, again, our cuspid is the longest single root in the mandibular arch. And we get smaller as we go anterior. We get progressively smaller as we go to the posterior. And the same with the total length of our teeth. It relates specifically to our roots. We get smaller as we go to the anterior and then progressively smaller as we go to the posterior. Now this total root length becomes very important when you get involved into uh, our endodontic uh, procedures in which we're trying to fill these uh, roots. We had to buy special instruments in order to get down the total length of some of these mandibular uh, cuspids because the length of the root becomes so long on them. But this gives you a general idea of the type of uh, overall trends that we're expecting you to recognize and that will unquestionably be uh, expected of you on your national board examinations in relation to the measurements on these teeth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.